Good morning. We have a lot to cover. Uh, I'm going to not dumb it down, but I'm going to, I guess, simplify. I'm um, trying to speak of uh, fewer styles than I normally would cover, and I'll try to uh, differentiate them as best I can. Um, everything I'm speaking of today and our last time, uh, we're going to meet after uh, Thanksgiving. I was going to say something about Thanksgiving, but I'll let that pass. Um, they just make the best of it. There'll be other Thanksgivings. Um, so uh, let me proceed, and uh, we'll look at first, not this. We're going to look at our homepage. And the last an announcement that I put up uh, is uh, the material that will be uh, covered in our final exam. The final exam, by the way, I'm going to make it available to you uh, December 16th. Um, and uh, you'll be able to take it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said that wrong. Uh, it'll be available to you on December 9th through the 17th. I have to turn my grades in at that point. Um, our final is scheduled for 8 in the morning on December 16th. So I'm uh, not going to hold us to that slender time. Uh, and uh, instead, I'm uh, going to give you, what was that, about a week's time uh, to take the final. So the final uh, will cover these last four chapters. I put the word final in front of them to differentiate them from uh, the other material. Um, we have a study guide. If I click on this, it needs to be downloaded. We'll look at that in a second. Uh, I have another study guide with images. That's probably, to be honest, the more valuable of the two. And then I'll have a few questions from the second exam. And these will be uh, uh, the most obvious questions. These will be the multiple choice, not with a picture. Um, and if you have questions, contact me and I'll elaborate further on that. Um, so if I select this one, I'm just going to walk through this sort of quickly. And uh, we have, uh, in fact, here's the other study guide. We have uh, first, uh, in fact, this is simply picking up uh, from the, uh, the second exam. We concluded with the Italian Renaissance. We're starting with the Italian Baroque age. This is the next uh, century. Um, this comes in effect 100 years after the Ardell of Michelangelo. And the artwork is uh, more extreme. Uh, it's more emotional, it's more dramatic, and if we think of Michelangelo's David, the figure is just simply standing there with a very inexpressive face, uh, the figure's not in action, or if we think of Leonardo's Last Supper, we have Jesus symmetrically in the center, he's looking directly, at least, at least looking toward us with no you know, expression on his face. And here, instead, we have this dramatic moment. We have people wailing, and we have this high value contrast. Uh, to the north, uh, we're gonna have uh, a, a different style. Th this one does not show that, that difference as much as uh, some, some works I'll show in a few minutes. Uh, but one of, the, one of the things that counts for this difference is uh, Martin Luther. I'm always inclined to say Martin Luther King. <laughs> but Martin Luther was a uh, priest. Uh, he didn't like uh, some of the uh, direction that the church was going. And so he uh, translated the Bible into uh, the common language, not from, you know, you know, if you're in a Catholic church, it would be read in Latin. Most people did not speak Latin. Uh, there's a sense of mystery, a separation. Uh, you know, there is a, a priest who, who uh, 
He would speak to the priest, and that priest in turn would speak to God. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, they're, they're sort of cutting through, I guess you could say, a lot of that uh, a tradition, a lot of that uh, ritual. And the artwork in the North is going to reflect that. Um, as we come into the uh, well, time of the American Revolution, uh, if we look at a time differentiation, we've moved forward more than 100 years. And we're going to find an artwork that is much more, uh, I don't know, it's, it's referential back to classical times. We're going to see uh, the, uh, the architecture, the sculptures, etc. Definitely uh, feel like classical Greek and Roman artworks. Uh, and really at the same time I'm presenting one following the other, there's a style called Romanticism. Romanticism is more emotional. It's much more like the, uh, the Baroque age. In fact, if we think of that pattern between the Renaissance and the Baroque, the Italian Baroque, that's the same uh, relationship, I guess, between this more inexpressive, you know, here's this oath. These people are swearing an oath. They're going to give their life for a cause. But there's no emotion on their faces. It has that placid calm. Uh, there's a clarity to the image. In fact, these figures are grouped between these three Roman arches. Here, it's a much more sprawling, chaotic image. Uh, this was a shipwreck. What a very different subject matter. Uh, there's a rescue. Uh, these people will be rescued, but it'll be, uh, th this is that much more emotional high pitch moment. Uh, what follows is, uh, as we've talked about before, was the invention of photography. Photography uh, uh, changed the way, I guess you could say, artists worked and also the way we saw the world. So instead of these historic scenes, these grand, huge paintings, this, this painting is in the Louvre, it's huge. These figures are life-sized. And uh, if we compare it to uh, like this painting by Renoir, it's small. Uh, he would literally take out a small canvas and he'd have his paints with him. There was a new invention, uh, tubes, tubes of paint, paste, you know, like toothpaste. And it was easy for artists to transport their paints and brushes and easels. And like a camera, they would set up in a location and instead of uh, just simply uh, of like a camera captures the light in front of them. The paint is, the, the artists, the impressionists painted what they saw. Uh, they in many ways mimicked a camera. Uh, the art that follows, we could say, turned away from the camera. It began to do what the camera couldn't do. So if we look at this painting by Vincent Van Gogh, actually Van Gogh, uh, he is uh, painting like the impressionists. The time period's not that great. Uh, he was in an asylum. He was a very troubled man. He committed suicide. Uh, and uh, in this painting, he's looking out a, a small window and he painted what he saw. He saw this night scene with this village underneath. But unlike Renoir, he's also express, expressing his inner feelings. There's an emotional quality here. That, that is the artist's emotional quality, not, not just reflecting you know, the, these people enjoying themselves. Here we have instead, uh, uh, we, we, we feel in many ways what the artist must have felt. Uh, in that same time frame, this is a four year gap between these paintings at Verdmuck, uh, also a painted, I guess the scene he could have he could have seen this, but he's also trying to express his inner feelings. In this painting, Monk, who was fairly young when he painted, he's in his 20s, um, had sort of a, 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 a terrible moment where all of a sudden uh, he, he was aware of, of everything around him was going to die, was going to disappear. Uh, and he's trying to capture that that sense of that sense of horror, I guess you could say, that sense of anxiety 
uh, in this painting. So if we look at these, uh, by comparing these three, this artist is painting what he saw. These two artists paint, painted what they felt. As we come into the uh, 20th century, we have artists like Picasso, artists like Dali and Miro, whose artwork, I guess you say, is even more abstract, more extreme, I guess you could say. Uh, they began to capture, uh, I, hope he, I hope Dali didn't see this. <laughs> uh, he's using uh, you know, his, his skill as a painter. He, sort of a classically trained painter. He's trying to communicate sort of dream-like quality, at least a sort of alternative to uh, the world that we view. Uh, and uh, we look at Moreau, Moreau is trying to capture dream-like quality uh, by drawing sort of like a child. He sort of just tap into sort of what came out. It's, it's uh, in many ways, both artists are headed in the same direction but with very different styles. After the Second World War, we have uh, an artist, Jackson Pollock, who uh, in many ways brings together a lot of these styles. It's abstract, it's expressive, at least the gestures are expressive, uh, but it's an artwork that, uh, I don't know, it's, um, I, I remember first time seeing these artworks and I was thinking, oh, what's the big deal <laughs> out there? You know, I could do that. Uh, I, I'm, uh, and, and there's a part of me that still feels that. And so I'm drawn back to more of the artists of the Renaissance or the Baroque age. Uh, Andy Warhol sort of merges in the 50s. He was a, uh, a graphic designer. He was an illustrator. And we see that sensibility in his work. And he began to not paint, but use uh, uh, graphics uh, graphic techniques, um, printmaking te techniques, uh, silk screening techniques to uh, uh, to pick the world around him. This time, uh, you know, seeing things uh, th th that are very common objects around him. You know, so these artists uh, have a completely different approach, and we're going to find that art after the Second World War uh, begins to. Uh, not have that same almost singular direction that we find in, in modernism. We almost can sense if we look at one artist, the next generation, you can say they built on that, that person's achievements or style, etc. And as we come into the really uh, almost, I, I say, I mean, this is hardly contemporary artwork, but as we come into, into contemporary work, uh, sometimes it's called postmodernism, postmodernism, after modernism, and now artists uh, almost have like free reign of combining classical imagery with very romantic imagery, or uh, you know things that really don't uh, seem to attach themselves to previous art history. Uh, that's what we'll talk about next time. Is uh, artwork from the uh, 20th century forward. So uh, I'm going to go back a little bit and come back to our home page and quickly walk through these first two uh, uh, chapters that will be covered in the final. So as we have talked about I guess we're getting a break. Okay, we start with the Baroque age. The Baroque age is full of emotion, has a lot of energy, a lot of movement, has a high value contrast, very dramatic. That's, I guess, what I want you to take away from the Baroque style. There is a Northern Baroque style, and uh, I at least want you to recognize the, the paintings by uh, Rembrandt. Uh, we'll look at one or two images of the Rococo, but that won't be on the test. Uh, we're next going to look at neoclassicism and then romanticism. So uh, 
if we look at the Baroque age, these, these are Italian Baroque images. They're dramatic. Uh, they're highly emotional. Uh, I think I made a reference a few minutes ago to Michelangelo's David. And in that, this is also a statue of David. In Michelangelo's work, again, the figure just stands there. There's no motion. There's no moment of release. There's no, you know, a determination upon uh, Michelangelo's David's face. Uh, here we have these mythological but highly emotional moments. But we could talk about mythology and why that's strange stuff. Um, or if we look at this image, uh, here we have a, uh, a painting of a, a scene where this, this woman has just severed the head of a general. There's his head. <laughs> Um, but that's an emotional moment. That is a highly, uh, you know, dramatic lighting, etc. So this is the Baroque age. The one we've seen already by Caravaggio. Um, architecturally, we're going to find it's a very ornate, very elaborate sort of style. I would love to talk about architecture more. And in fact, if we had met, we would have gone and walked through Sherman and then the library. Uh, but I can't talk about what uh, we would have done. <laughs> That's sort of meaningless. To the north, we have uh, a different audience. Instead of the church, uh, artists were basically, um, their patrons were uh, the middle class. And they sold paintings to uh, uh, merchants and, and uh, uh, people, I guess, with enough money to buy uh, a, a painting. But not the aristocracy, you know, not the church. And we have, uh, in fact, I, I, I've seen almost all the paintings. There's not there that many left of, uh, um, I'm getting off the subject. This is Vermeer. I think Vermeer is a, these paintings are gems. These paintings are tiny. I spent years on each of them. And by the way, uh, if you look at this one, look at the, the out of focus, close imagery, if we look at the details, etc., it looks like a photograph. And it's very likely when uh, Vermeer used a camera obscura to uh, at least create the composition. The Rococo is, uh, I'm just going to put it very briefly, is a much more ornate, elaborate sort of, uh, if, if the early Baroque is highly emotional, uh, that emotion's been uh, eliminated with just uh, opulence. Uh, everything is just uh, ornate and it's sort of very prettified, sort of uh, almost silly sort of world. Uh, against that, we have what's called neoclassicism. And neoclassicism ties in with the American and French Revolution. This is a time when uh, the kings were overthrown. So if this is the art of the kings, this is the art of the people in revolution. And uh, we look at artists like David. He was involved actually in the French Revolution. He was nearly executed. Uh, he had to uh, argue for his life. Um, and we have this moment when uh, he tapped back into uh, Roman history. This is a moment when these three sons are swearing an oath to their father that they will avenge him. They will fight to the death. Basically, the painting is saying there are things more important than your life, than your interests. Uh, if we look at this painting by David again, we have Socrates. Socrates took his own life. He was sentenced. Uh, for uh, uh, corrupting the youth and uh, was sentenced to death. And here he is uh, taking uh, poison. He was, a, he was an older man than they're depicted. He's in pretty good shape for a man who's 70, 80 years old. Uh, it's interesting. So here's this, uh, this person who also says there's things more important than his life. Uh, if you look at this and count the number of figures, in many ways we have a painting that alludes to Jesus and his disciples. 
Um, but this is an age when uh, people are fighting against the kings. And the kings at that time, this is the king of England, king of France, etc., were the head of state, also the head of the, the church. So the artist doesn't directly reference Jesus, but under the surface, uh, we have that same sort of symbolism. Um, that neoclassicism, we find it also in the American Revolution. So if we look at this, this is a painting of Paul Revere. Um, it has, I guess we could say, the qualities of the Northern Baroque age. It's a portrait. It's got that high value contrast. Um, it's uh, a beautiful painting by one of the really uh, early masters of American art. Um, but if we look at the artwork of like Washington and some of the, the founding fathers, uh, we're going to find uh, that it is, they're, they're depicted as if they are Roman gods or Greek gods, or at least uh, in that sort of classical and expressive sort of uh, uh, gaze. Uh, this painting used to be at the Capitol and uh, it's a huge sculpture, not a painting. Uh, and uh, Congress couldn't stand it anymore and they voted it out. <laughs> There's something about, uh, that's not how I think of Washington, but we can see clearly that the artist is trying to connect Washington back to ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Uh, if we look at uh, the Lincoln Memorial, this looks like what? It looks like the, uh, the Parthenon, which uh, of course is uh, maybe the building we most identify with classical Greece. Uh, it has that uh, same you know, colonnade. It has that same sort of classic calm, I guess. In, in, inside, instead of a statue of Athena, we have Lincoln, and Lincoln's been deified. Uh, so uh, we go through Washington, D.C., you would find all of these buildings that look like they came from ancient Greece or ancient Rome. And that's because these, uh, it was a new country and it's trying to gain, I guess, credibility and it's making that linkage with the past. Also, uh, democracy at least has its beginnings in, in with the Greeks and the Romans. Um, the Romans created the uh, first Senate. Uh, the uh, people voted, not everyone voted. Um, not everybody voted when the United States was first formed, but that idea was there. And in time, uh, the United States is more truly uh, uh, become the nation it sort of professed it would be in the beginning. Um, so if we look at the order, the clarity of these classical images, you know, the, these inemotional uh, uh, artworks that link back to, very purposely back to the beginnings of democracy, the beginnings of, and, and without just going through a litany, we can look at uh, the beginnings of philosophy, the beginnings of uh, uh, of mathematics, the beginnings of order, I guess we could say. Um, the artwork that follows, or at least is in conflict with classicism, is romanticism. And there's a lot of isms, I'm sorry there's so many, but I promise you we, uh, when I took art history and as a graduate student, uh, I learned hundreds of isms. <laughs> and a lot more names. Um, so if we look at Jericho's painting, the, Ras the, the Medusa, that was the ship that sunk. It's this chaotic scene. Uh, there was actually reported cannibalism among the survivors. So it's a, a, a very different imagery. Uh, this is another painting we've seen. Uh, this is by Goya. And Goya painted uh, what he saw. So in many ways, it ties in with photography. You know, you, 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 you uh, He's, he, the artist literally was standing here and he didn't have a canvas in front of him, but this is probably what he sketched 
and then he turned it into this very large painting. But this is a highly emotional moment. These people be executed. And if we compare his paintings with even his later paintings, uh, we'll find that his work becomes even more emotional. Uh, Goya uh, went deaf, actually the same time as Beethoven, and so his oddities of history. He, and after he became deaf, he, uh, as you might, uh, it makes sense, he withdrew in many ways, and his paintings become more, I guess, expressionistic. Uh, this is the death of reason, uh, and uh, the sleep of reason. And we have this painting that uh, <laughs> he had this over his dining room table. So it's, it's going back to mythology, but it goes back to the Titans. It goes back to chaos. And this is Saturn devouring their own youth. And my dog's barking right outside my door. Uh, so anyway, uh, we will look at these and uh, I'm gonna go back and quickly, and I'm trying to keep this short, um, I'm uh, failing to some degree as I speak about these things. I really care about them. And, and, and uh, I, I'm trying, um, hopefully, to communicate some of that enthusiasm. Um, uh, this just isn't the format for me to, <laughs> to be enthusiastic. Um, so if we look at uh, the impact of photography, that's what we're beginning with. There's a car racing down the street. Um, we're gonna look at first uh, the Impressionists and then the Post-Impressionists, and then we'll take a break. So as we talked about previously, these first photographs, and that's a wrong date, 1826. Um, and the first more popular form of photography uh, comes about a, uh, will come 12 years later. And uh, photography is immediately, uh, boy, people love photography. Uh, the photography studios spring up everywhere. And part of that is uh, Daguerre sold the patent to the French government and they just simply gave it away to the world. And so within a relatively short period of time, people are having their portraits taken. This is Emily Dickinson. Uh, uh, we have uh, other sort of celebrities of the uh, uh, 1800s. Um, and uh, we can see that trying to capture the world. Oh, oh, I should, this is Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass is he's a young man um, and uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Um, if we compare uh, uh, this work then to what we last looked at with the uh, uh, Romanticists, we find a, a whole different direction in art. And as I, I mentioned just a moment ago, artists like Renoir, in this case, in this case Claude Monet, uh, literally set up an easel, a painting that's not maybe 30 inches maximum in width. He had his paints and brushes with him. And uh, if he saw blue, he painted blue. He saw red, he painted red. He painted what he saw. In many ways, operated as a camera would. You saw this one a few moments ago. Uh, it's sort of the, uh, they're painting the, uh, the middle class. These are people who uh, uh, were out enjoying themselves. Uh, this may seem like a strange thing to realize, but really up until this time, there wasn't much of a middle class. Uh, there wasn't places for them to enjoy themselves. The first uh, really parks, the first public parks, first they were cemeteries. Uh, and then there were garden parks, etc. They were meant for the middle class to, uh, to begin to enjoy. Uh, they had, I guess we could say time off, less time off than we have in terms of expected employment. Uh, people commonly work six days a week, uh, 10 hours a day. But it's a, uh, there is now uh, that uh, expectation, I guess, of enjoyment of life. Uh, we have, um, I'd love to elaborate on this. In Davenport, for instance, there's the first garden park that's west of the Mississippi. 
uh, and we have uh, uh, garden cemeteries, etc., that were literally made for people to, uh, on a day off, go out and to, uh, you know, visit relatives, but also sort of enjoy uh, a, a, a natural environment. You know, more and people increasingly move into the city. Um, artists. Uh, began to realize uh, they almost couldn't compete with the camera. They began to do what the camera couldn't. So if we look at this painting by Cezanne, it in many ways is a impressionist painting, uh, but he's beginning to look at maybe the underlying structure of the world around him. He's, you can see he's beginning to break things down to more elemental forms, breaking them down to cubes and to, uh, you know, blocks of color. You know, he's looking be, be sort of underneath the skin of the world around him. And if you look at this even more abstract piece and compare it to an artist who follows shortly, we begin to see artists are moving away from painting what they saw and now painting, making changes. Um, not arbitrary changes, but they're no longer just simply capturing what was before them. And so artists like Picasso, sort of, uh, who was, by the way, was very influenced by African art. Uh, he went to an exhibition of Afri African art, uh, and in many ways, we're looking at someone who interprets Af African art. And if we had more time, we would have looked at African art. Uh, and it's much more diverse uh, than uh, sometimes presented. There are artists who uh, worked in a whole range of medium, media, et cetera. I uh, would like to have looked at more Asian art, more uh, uh, Middle Eastern art, uh, uh, the artwork of, of indigenous people around the world. Uh, but it feels like in this sort of compressed time that we're getting together, I wanted to maybe touch on names that there's some expectation that you would be familiar with. Um, that, that that's at least was was part of my thinking. So as we come into the 20th century, we I, I, we will look at artists, not just white males, <laughs> um, uh, but it's uh, we're going to look at artists who see things from uh, maybe different vantage points, and uh, to me that's fantastic. I uh, I really embrace that. Uh, uh, the energy that we see in the last uh, well, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 years, etc. So I'm going to end now. Uh, we meet next time. We'll pick up from this point and uh, uh, looking forward to uh, hearing from you. So uh, do, uh, do contact me, okay? I need to, uh, well, I guess you're not going to see me again. <laughs> I thought, uh, Oh, here it is. Here I am. And uh, there I stay. Okay. See you in a couple weeks. Bye.